And we are live! How are you? How's everyone? So excited to be back here again for our second episode of the What Would You Do show by popular demand. Thank you so much for all your messages and you know showing me so much love for all the show and how much it helped you. Today we're actually going to talk about a very very interesting and very very important topic and of course I have two amazing professionals who are going to help us with today's show. Avi Ben Mordechai, which is a licensed psychotherapist, and yeah, Esther Liviev, which everybody thinks is Esther Azaria. <laughs> <laughs> Azaria is actually her husband's name. This is true. Who, yes. Who is a physician assistant and health coach as well. And today we're going to be discussing a very, very important topic. But before we start with tonight's topic, Avi decided to surprise Esther and I with something very unexpected. Well, it's not really a surprise. <laughs> what we should say is, today we were discussing, we said, so let's talk a little bit about, before the show starts, let's talk a little bit about what we're going to talk about. Let's get some notes down. And we were both discussing, and Esther added, she said, you know, we should add some visual I aids. I had no idea where that was going. And I don't know how I missed this conversation <laughs> altogether. So she said, you should add some visual aids. And so we were thinking, what should we, what should we bring, uh, what should we bring to the live that can... Um, I told him in, Legos. I said, why don't we... <laughs> I think in, I in combination, in combination uh, with this live and mental health, um, what is better... Then bringing in, are you guys ready for this? Don't freak out. Stay with me. Are you ready? Here we go. Look what we have here. A live, actual tarantula. Now people might ask, why the heck would you have a live tarantula? I think some people think it's fake. Should we, should we, um... I think they believe you. Experiment? It is real, right? It's moving. For anybody that's curious, it's actually moving. We don't need to open it. I think we should experiment. I think so. I think so. Can we? I experiment? think Esther will go first. Esther, Esther can you experiment here, here for us? Here you go, us? Esther. We'll we'll put on we'll put on gloves, and we'll say we'll actually say what lesson you can learn from a spider. From this is called the red knee tarantula. It does not bite, and everything you know. People people oftentimes when you see a spider or an insect, right? Your immediate response is, "Ew, get that away from me! I don't want to see it!" Right? What is that? I'm so afraid of it. There's actually many people who have serious phobias of it. And we can talk later about why I have a spider as part of my practice. But for now, we want to actually discuss what life lesson can we learn from a spider? So what do you, what do you ladies think? What lesson? Uh, the we lesson learn? I learned, if you see a spider, don't pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is, I'm only How about, this for So, right so before we were actually, Esther, you were telling me something really awesome. About what, what I, I actually really respect spiders. When I see a spider in my house, my kids scream, they're like, oh my God, kill it. I, I like actually scoop it up with a cup and I'll throw it outside gently into the backyard because to me, spiders are a little bit um, special. They are so like, they're architects and mm -hmm. happen to like, my husband's an architect. He's a rabbi now. So, but one second, hold on. Can we remove that? Yeah, it's going to go off. Okay. So. So I, I'll tell you, I really do respect spiders for their creativity. Yeah. And I can't believe I'm going to do this. So let's do this. Are you ready, guys? On live camera. So we're still thinking about a name. We were thinking about Charlotte. What do you guys think? It's a female. It's a, it is a female. It is a female. Charlotte. I like Margaret. Margaret. That's cute. It's All not right. going to crawl ready? on me, right? Of course it will crawl on me. That's, what, that's what they do. Oh, yeah. Take away your teeth. <laughs> Pick up your hand a little listen. higher, Esther. Here you go. Look at that. And Esther over here, I was just gonna say, Esther Azaria is holding a spider. <laughs> <laughs> so close. So pick it up higher. So this lesson, this oh, is a live. Bite me? No, it's definitely not gonna bite. It's a friendly spider. And what are we learning from this? Can again? I, can I so, touch it? You can, yeah, you can lightly, gentle petting, gentle. It there doesn't like me. I can probably. There you go. So what lesson? So you, uh, I guess you're gonna be our model for tonight, holding okay. the spider. Esther, well, so you could keep holding. So. <laughs> Okay, who? If you guys want Yechavit to hold the spider, please don't don't like. <laughs> let us know, oh my God. and she will definitely hold it. it so it's really touching every part. Yeah, of Yeah, hundred percent. The reason why we're wearing gloves, these are not poisonous spiders. I think you should pick it up a little bit higher so people can see. These are not poisonous spiders, but the reason why we're wearing gloves is sometimes when they get excited, they can kind of flick their hairs into your hand, 
and um, we, you know, we, we don't want it to just give you some irritation. So I that's feel what, a little bit okay. Yeah, you feel, you good. feel okay. It. So look at that. You know, when you're afraid in the beginning and you do something slowly, you expose yourself. It's so beautiful. So, oh, the reason why I closed it, I want her to put her hand here so oh. she can prop it up. Your hand here, so you can prop it up. No, no. Your elbow. Oh, my elbow. <laughs> there you go. Okay, so... So what lesson, what lesson can we learn from a spider? Now think about it this way. <laughs> yeah. what, I, think, I think people are saying you should hold it. No, I, thank am you for I, not liking it. If I, I can do it, you can do it. I'm sorry. It. Remember right. OBGYN here, can... here we go. Here we go. Ready? One. Just for a brief second, everyone. Just for a second. Let's Close go. Let's your go. eyes. It's easy. Keep it. There you go. Look at watch, that, guys. Watch. She is holding a live tarantula on camera. So we're going to talk about in a second, if you back. breathe on that spider, it can attack you. Don't breathe. No, no. She's all good. How do we put him back? All right. So we're going to put Don't Charlotte me. back. Everybody say goodbye to Charlotte. Look at that. This oh, is a hot cup of tea under here. All right. Okay. And some delicious grapes, but she's going back. Thank you. All right. Oh my God. I'm so sweaty. These things are very okay. wet. So some lessons we can learn from a spider and we can actually learn lessons from every single animal that's out there in, in the universe right but number one is spiders they don't think about where they should make their web right when they see a nice corner they just begin to start spinning their web and creating a home for themselves same thing you know with people sometimes when you when you talk to people they, 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 they always, they, they say that they wait for the, the perfect moment, right? Um, they wait, uh, in order to start, they have to have uh, a lot of money to start something or the perfect business, the perfect house in order to, to make, to create something perfect beautiful. Perfect their skills to it's, get on it, whatever. hundred percent, exactly. Whatever. So life is not about being perfect. We're not angels. We're human beings. It's being able to make what you have your tool and make it comfortable for yourself. So that's number one. We also have um, we also have a, 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 another skill that we can learn from spiders is believing in yourself. You know, sometimes in life where we 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 doubt ourselves. There's so many people dealing with with self confidence issues and and low self esteem. And this is this is across across the board. Females, males, all ages, young and old, people are dealing with self esteem struggles where they feel like they cannot do it. And something like this, a lesson to learn from a spider is. Just because, you know, they're so small and it's going to rain tomorrow and break their web, they still make sure that they're determined and they do it one step at a time. No matter what the weather will bring, they will still stay strong. So these are just some lessons. There's a bunch more, Powerful. but we're going to continue on the exciting we're gonna topic. We're going to hop on to the real topic of tonight's right. show. Are you Before ready? Before I even knew the spider is going to be a guest on our show, which is going to be marriage. Very, very popular topic. I've gotten so many that messages lately requesting this topic in particular because statistically, Avi is going to go over the statistics of marriage and divorce in a few seconds and you're going to be shocked to hear the statistics of who gets married and who gets divorced. What is the ratio between marriage and divorce? Right. And I put a question last night on my page asking what would be the number one suggestion you can give to someone who is dating about marriage and the responses were amazing and the one response that I want to share that actually was called into me by someone who said I don't want to post because I don't feel comfortable can you please post this answer for me I thought this answer was brilliant and before we go on to the to with the show I'm going to share that answer with everyone who's watching she said you know people make a mistake when they get married they don't really look to the person's character. A lot of people get married for the wrong reason. And the number one reason, she says, that I've been noticing, especially in girls who are in America, this person is not originally from America, she moved to America a couple of years ago, is that they look at the guy based on his finances, based on his wealth, based on his status. When you get married to someone, Based on someone's riches, profession, status in life, how popular he is, all that is temporary. All that will come and go. Please tell your viewers the number one thing in a marriage is to get married for the person's character. You may not have the richest husband. You may not have the smartest husband with the biggest, you know, most prideful profession. But all that can be built with time. People should get married with the right intentions in mind. 
And I thought that was so brilliant what she said that I wanted to come on here and share that with everyone, especially those of you who are in the dating process, because I get lots of messages from single guys, especially telling me, do you have a girl for me? Because I'm looking for someone. And when I ask them, how old are you? A lot of these guys are already in their late 30s, early 40s, and they have never been married. So we're going to hop on and we're going to discuss marriage a little bit further in depth because our purpose is to stay married, get married and stay married. So I'm just going to be- can I, can I ask, can I just ask a quick question? Yeah. From, from why do you ladies think that, um, that some women, like you said, I'm just going to quote it based on what the, what the messages were prior. Why do you ladies think that sometimes women want to get married to a guy who will get her that fat ring or get her that big house or get her, you know, the, have an expensive car, an expensive uh, luxury I, lifestyle? I, I think a lot of it is peer pressure. Okay. I mean, I got married when I was in Yeshiva University, and my husband and I were both students. He didn't have a wedding ring to give me or engagement ring right away. And all the girls were like, oh, what does he do? How much does he make? And not how much does he make, but like, where's your ring? You know, basically the ring is like a symbol of like, how much can he afford for mm -hmm. you, right? That's a contractual, mm -hmm. like whatever. Mm -hmm. For me, I was like, I'm okay with a cubic zirconium just to like, just mm -hmm. stop the conversations. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, I mean, it's nice to be valued and mm -hmm. have something that's like genuine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that wasn't though my original goal. So, so when we talk about value, Every, everybody has different types of value, right? Somebody is okay with, uh, with a nice one bedroom apartment and some want that luxury mansion, right? So how do we decide where's, where's the line or is there a line and where is it coming from that the person wants um, that luxury lifestyle before they're even married? You know, if, you, if we think about a relationship, um, the best feeling, and I heard this story, is, this is the greatest lesson we can learn. There was this child, he, his father said, you have to get out of the house and you have to go to work. So his, he didn't want to go to work. So he comes to his mom and he says, "Mom, uh, give me money so I can give it to dad, so he doesn't get he doesn't get upset." So the first week she gives him a hundred bucks. He gives it to the father. The father takes it and he throws it into the fire. And week two comes back and and he does the same thing. Week three, the mother's like, "I'm sorry, son, I can't give you the money. You have to go to work." The child goes to work and he makes sixty dollars. He gives it to the father again. The father takes it and he throws it into the fire. He's this burning kid, the money. So it was a lesson. He jumps into he jumps into the fire to take that sixty dollars, even though it's if it's less, even though it was less. What do we learn from here? Something that you earn and work for by yourself, you will value a lot more. Especially, especially that you um, you're building something with your spouse. You that's number one. Something when you build an empire with your spouse, this is something also that connects both of you. If if you're coming into this with them already having it, again, if you have it, that's not a problem. But I'm saying if this is something that you're looking for, I mean you're taking away the golden opportunity to build an empire for yourself with your spouse and something that can actually really bring you closer. Can I add to that? I'm just very curious. As yeah. much as we love having a lavish lifestyle, a big house, a fancy car. Uh, and sometimes I feel like I have a house, but then it's not big enough. Mm. Like we have to get even a bigger You're house. You're never happy with your it's life. It's almost like, does it mean that in life we all need mm. a house and we all need an expensive mm. car and we all need that it, you know, expensive bag and the latest, greatest phone? Like why is it that we can't be happy with small things the way we used to be happy with them in the past? Like I remember growing up in America and having a one and a half bedroom and sleeping on the couch with my sister my brother had the one the bedroom because we have one boy and two girls and my parents had the other bedroom and we were like we, we never even thought about the size of our house and we were so content and mm. so happy and always like it's almost like why don't we become a society where size matters mm. where status matters where everything is about the next big thing what happened to just enjoying the small pleasures of life? And again, I have no nothing against living a big fancy lifestyle. It's just we're never enjoying what we have if we're always looking for something more. I think a lot of it has to do with the scrolling on social media when you see, you know, that comparative reality. Like they at my age have this and I don't have this. Mm -hmm. So like when I was a kid, I didn't know who went on vacation to where, right? Now you see all these images. Well, maybe not today because of the pandemic, but like I know people who got off of social media because they couldn't stand their relatives or friends 
go on all these vacations and it made them like uncomfortable about mm-hmm. themselves that they can't appreciate the value of what they have and on top of that really appreciating where you're at in life like when we were kids we were excited to have a little toy yeah like it wasn't a big deal now like the we, kids want the latest we life. actually we have a comment from zoe she wrote i'll tell you where it comes from media and our oh, society yeah exactly our daughters being plundered with images bigger bigger and better which is the diamond right and movies uh that's uh, and say yes right. to the dress right. all this shows their this shows goal movies, is to right? make them sell a product uh-huh. not, not you know to make you think you must have it to be happy wow okay Isn't so that the, true the, the power like that's the, the power, of the power. they know how to make you feel right. something manipulate your mind right. that you're at a deficit if you don't have that i have mm-hmm. another question maybe avi you can help me understand this even when a guy comes to propose to a girl right mm-hmm. and he brings the jewelry again I'm not saying that it's okay to buy her, you know, some fake ring. That's not what I mean. But if you get a jewelry or a watch or a certain bag that's not very expensive, it's almost like sometimes that's enough to break the engagement off because Mm -hmm. that guy is cheap. That guy is not going to hold up to standards. Mm -hmm. There's some, you know, we have to, there's some, you know, like red lights that go off. Why does that happen? Mm -hmm. Why can't we just love someone for who they are and not expect so much from them? Right. That's a very good question. You know, interestingly, if a guy, you know, there's certain people that are so generous that don't have a lot of money. They can buy you a slice of pizza, but because they're so generous and the way they do it and the way they present it can be so beautiful and, and, and amazing where you can just love them for that one slice of pizza, right? But at the same time, a guy can bring you the most expensive steak and and have that cheap streak to him or and, and you feel it right away right so it's all about how you present yourself and your characteristic you know these things come out you can only fake it so much but small little red flags on the date will come out and you can see if they are cheap or if they have this type of characteristic and maybe they're spending money just to feel like they're superior but in reality this is not coming from a genuine place is there a way to tell when someone's genuine I think so. What do you think? I think you should trust your intuition. Yeah, trust your gut. Always, that's actually rule number one. Always go with your gut. Sometimes people say, how do I know if this person is the right one for me, right? That click. There's people that always talk. Did you ever hear somebody say, did you have a click with that person, right? So how do you know if you have the click? Go with your gut. You know, you know that feeling. If you're feeling the butterflies inside your stomach, that's, that's, your intuition telling you that this person may be for you. Or tarantulas. Or tarantulas, right? <laughs> I remember when I got married, I told my wife, I said, it's not butterflies, I have dragons in my stomach Aww, flying. Um, all right, so let's. So now we have some really interesting questions, okay? Are, are you ready for the questions? Do you want to continue with? Yeah, so the questions are going to be, uh, they're general questions, so there's nothing personal that we're going to answer about our own life. Um, I, this game is really to bring awareness to just our opinion on these different topics. We don't know what, right. We don't know what these questions are. Okay. So they're being picked out randomly. Avi picked them out. So Esther and I are going to be surprised to what questions are coming our way. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. So you can also answer the questions on live. And we'll read them out loud and we'll discuss them. So if there's anything you want, or we play also, we'll do the same thing. Um, If you want us, if there's so many people who appreciated that, by the way, the replay. I know many of you guys who can't watch now, so this is for you too. All right, we're mixing. We're we're mixing the deck. If you want to know which game we're playing, should I tell them the game? Yeah. All right. This is one of my favorite games. It's called the Ungame. Okay, it's very inexpensive. You can order it on Amazon. This is not a sponsored ad, I promise you guys, but this is very helpful. I use it in my practice all the time and I love it. It brings on so many important uh, topics and conversations and you can really connect with a person on a completely different level that you never expected. So here we go. All right. So let's 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 mix up the deck, okay? Ooh, this is a juicy one. Should I show it to the crowd? Yes. All right, here you go. Give it is. I think it's backwards. So give your definition of a good marriage. I'll let Esther go first. (laughs) Thanks. So you could think about. (laughs) I mean, these are real, real tough questions. Ooh, my definition of a good marriage. Can I can I say a few things? I don't. Hundred percent. There's no. There's no rules. Yeah. Um, I think uh, a welcoming space. Like when when you see your partner, you feel like there's there's kind of like joy Mm -hmm. even if you guys haven't had a good 
maybe last couple of days because you aren't really connecting but but really learning how to forgive each other mm -hmm. and um, appreciating the moments when you're kind of in that happy space mm -hmm. and really just appreciating each other um, a good marriage is also a committed marriage like when if one of you is not feeling well you can rely on your partner or maybe develop that skill in your marriage if you're new at new to this or this is something you want to grow you can develop a really good marriage too if you're if you're willing to you know be consistent yeah. with it um, but I also think chemistry is powerful in a good marriage because if something's wrong in that department everything will crumble I feel like that 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 really is the glue that helps perpetuate the relationship further um, and a good marriage has time for each other Meaning, it's not like if, if let's say, your partner needs you right now and you're on your phone because somebody's texting you, a good marriage knows how to create boundaries with friends and social things and like work-related things and just being connected. That's something that I actually really um, strive for because, mm -hmm. um, you know, I am very social on Facebook and stuff and, and off of Facebook. <laughs> so I, I really have to be intentional to make my marriage feel good mm. about that, you know, like to be just with my spouse when we're out on a on like right. a conversation. To be focused on. To be focused. Focus. I think a good marriage makes time for yeah. each other on yeah, that stuff. Yeah, hundred percent. Being stuff. present. And listening yeah. to each other's yeah. requests. Mm -hmm. That's a big one. That's, that is a big one. Good answer. That was. That's, Very good. This answer. question. We'll make my is, husband watch it's, that. It's it's really it really puts you guys in the hot seat because this You're is. You're gonna be answering is, it too. Oh no! Well. So so, so this is this is this is a tough one. So you covered. What do you think? What uh, give your definition of a good marriage? A good marriage for me is having not just me. I, what I think is a definition of a good marriage. My opinion of it is having a partner that you can come home to, and be able to share your fears, your happy moments, your excitement. Everything that's in your heart that you can't share with anybody else, a marriage to me is coming home and knowing that that other partner will understand you and love you for who you are. He will love your flaws. What everybody else in the world looks at as a flaw, he will look at as something to love about you. He won't judge you when you fail. He won't criticize you when you're not perfect, but he will let you grow in a loving manner because the criticism that we get from the outside world is enough to put so much pressure on us a good marriage is having a partner who wants to help you become a better version of yourself and wants to become a better version of himself and you grow together and you have the same views of life together you know how you want to raise those kids together you know when you come home and you see your partner and he knows when something is bothering you without you even have to tell him that it's bothering you. That to me that's, that's a is a too good match. Men cannot mind read, I think. That's, that's going to be hard. That's me. I just feel like somebody who is your partner in life can feel you. It's almost like you get a call that. from him and you're like, I was just thinking about you. It's that level of love for each other and that level of when you're not in my life, there's a void. There's something missing. Of course, everyone needs that space from each other. Space is good sometimes, but to go to sleep on a fight and then be okay with not talking for days, that makes me afraid. To me, that's not a definition of a good marriage. A good marriage is being able to fight, but saying, I'm making up after this fight because I'm already missing my partner. I can't not talk to him for days. A few hours is too much. That's my definition of a good marriage. What about you? Ari? I'm just gonna. I'm, I mean, I'm. I'm not gonna get that too, that deep because you ladies are, you guys are, you ladies are killing it. All right. So I'll tell say say this. Um, I'll be really quick. A marriage is like your person. You know, when something really good happens to you, you know, you get a promotion. You you get you you know your your salary goes up or something that you were waiting for really you know happens. Who's the first person you call? Who's that first person you want to yeah. tell, right? As soon as that you have that feeling inside, oh, I want to call my spouse. That's I think in my in my in my opinion. Again, that can also be with a best friend. But can a spouse be a best friend? That's another topic for another time because that's a big topic in itself. But I think it's having a feeling that this is your person through thick and thin. Yeah, that's I my so. that's my that's my uh, definition. Whoever heard anything that makes them think I don't have a good marriage? Because let's say their husband maybe doesn't understand everything that they feel. Or wife. Uh, or wife. I want you to think about the fact that a good marriage is not something that looks beautiful all the time. Right. A good marriage is a willingness 
to work with each other. And that's what that means. Like when you pick somebody, my mom tells me this, a, a good marriage is not about, picking a partner is not about how much can he give you. It's about how much can you offer. And when you switch that, that role of like, well, how much can I get from this guy, like in this relationship to how much can I offer to help the relationship be better? It shifts the whole mindset of like a good marriage because it makes you be aware that you're empowered in that I sense. think it actually ties back to the question with that big ring or the big house or the nice car. Um, you know, it's not what I can get out of my spouse. It's what can I put into the relationship so we can actually be great together. All I right. think Michael, you answered very well. Let's read Michael's Michael's answer. Michael, shout uh, out to my cousin. Michael, a good marriage is the physical, psychological, and social union of both spouses for the lifetime of their one uh, of of either one of them. Absolutely, um, you know they say they say three th the three top main um, components make up a good marriage, which is which is communication, which is money being able to talk about money in a peaceful way, and also that, that physical connection, right? Sex. Um, so let's move on. What is something you did when you first entered your relationship that you no longer do? I'll be answered so that one. That's please. a big one, right? What is something you did when you first entered the relationship that you no longer do? When we get married, right? It's so, uh, I'm just going to generalize, right? Um, it's so, it can be so exciting. It's new experiences, right? You're living together. Um, you're going, you might go on your honeymoon. You're taking pictures. You're having a good time, right? And you feel like you have so much time for each other and doing all these new experiences together. But what happens is when life gets busy and the kids come and, you know, both of you guys are now working to pay your mortgage and pay for tuition, life gets really hard. And the things that you used to do before kind of fall apart and we forget why we all why we started we forget that love starts to fade away this is something like Esther you said you know every single marriage every single marriage there's fights and arguments and bickering every single day it doesn't mean you know once a week every day there'll be some still something silly why did you leave the towel on the bed why are the socks on the floor why is my dinner salty or you know every single day there's something but it's being able to kind of with that, still build a beautiful empire and a beautiful home. So, Esther, what is something people do when they're dating that they forget to do when they're married? Ooh. Uh, <clears throat> compliment each other. That's a good one. I like that That's one. That's a very good one. Right? Yeah. Speak up. I'm not sure. I, I think complimenting each other is a big one. You know? I compliment myself <laughs> like to my husband. I'll be like, you like the food? It's so delicious. <laughs> so, you know. It reminds him to, you know, be a little bit more... You know, I think the way I would answer this question, again, maybe it's not for everybody, when you're married for many years, yeah. you know, like when you're dating, it's almost like you want to call your husband or your wife every second, you just want to talk to them on a constant basis and you miss them and you're constantly checking in on them. With time, that kind of fades away. That yes. need of it's having to call else. and to find out how they're doing and you're to right, make time, right. it kind of fades away. Right. We kind of don't miss each other the way we used to when we were dating each other mm -hmm. when we're sitting with each other on the table we're so busy with our social with our phones and everything else but when we were dating it's almost like there was nothing else but him and i and that thing is kind of like a little bit distant as years go by and that's why it's very important to make time to to go out and time to spend together because we're so busy with everything else around us that we don't have that one-on-one -on -one time the way we used to intimately when we were dating. Mm. So we actually got a few comments here. I'll read Zoe's comment. I'm, I'm curious to know what you, what you think about this. She says, I'm going to say something not so traditional. Sharing and understanding here in America been taken to different level. It's too, it's like too much expectations, not realistic. Husband is not your priest, therapist, mommy. Stop over sharing and expecting him to understand and support you. Wow, that's a big one. What do you ladies think about that? What does oversharing mean, though? How, how, what is uh, everybody's understanding of oversharing? I think is going to so be a little different. So I think. Go ahead. You want us? Do you want no, to do this I, one? No, I, 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 okay. I don't know. So this is a big one. Are you supposed to tell everything to your spouse? Uh, just for quickly, Hannah, we're talking about marriage. Um, you just joined, so the topic right now is about marriage. We're having a question and answer session. Um, are you allowed to share? Everything? Should you should you share everything with your spouse? I don't think that's necessary. No, it's, what do you think? 
it depends on what that topic is. So okay. I don't think there's a, everything is very, very broad. Okay. Uh, for some people, they may buy something very mm. expensive, for example, okay. and they don't think if they have the need of telling their husband, mm -hmm. I don't think that's appropriate mm -hmm. personally, because finances is something combined. Mm -hmm. So when we say everything, it's everybody's personal judgment. Of course, there's no right or wrong, but we have to be very, very careful with this because some people feel that it's okay to hide things from their spouse. It could be hiding things from your wife. Oh, I'm gonna buy um, whatever and I'm not gonna tell my wife about it. I'm gonna book something and I'm gonna say I'm going away, but I'll let her know and like right before I go away, a day before that mm -hmm. I have a business trip to go to. Wow. So if we're kind of living a life where we feel like we shouldn't overshare, it's a very, I, I find it to be very, very thin thread It's there. a fine line, yeah. We need to be very, very careful with so, that. So, in, in the therapy world, um, it's not suggested to tell everything to your spouse. Boundaries are also very important, right? What happens to you, what somebody says to you, again, you can share about your feelings, right? But sometimes there's certain things, also you should have your spouse on a, on a certain level of respect, right? Don't get too comfortable. Yeah, your spouse should be there for you through thick and thin, but also when you're too comfortable, then you can say things and feel like, ah, who cares? It's just my spouse, right? When you put them on a, on a, on a pedestal and, and look at them, uh, you know, give, giving them the respect that they deserve, it automatically, you automatically don't just share, let's say, let's say somebody got you, somebody complimented you at work, right? It's not going to do anything better for your marriage. So why say, you know, I'm saying a male, some, if a male compliments Maybe you he'll work, feel the need to compliment you more because he's like, ooh. I hear that. Like, but, it depends. I'm just saying. I know, I like, know. But it has to be some intention to be, yeah. behind it, what you're saying. Right. So, so. I don't think you can possibly actually share everything in your right. life with your spouse. Well, go ahead. Sometimes, sometimes people do, and then they get themselves in trouble. So the the rule of thumb is at this point, don't don't share everything. And I hear what you're saying. There's put there's too much expectations put on. And I think what uh, Esther was saying, uh, men are not mind readers, and why w women are not mind readers too. And don't try to be a mind reader. Sometimes if you think your spouse is uh, thinking about something and you're not sure. Ask them in a very calm and respectful way. And, you know, maybe something that you assume is completely off. You know what I think is an example, again, this is my personal opinion of what you shouldn't share. For example, okay, I, I, told, I said things that you should probably try to share with your husband before or your wife. What you shouldn't share. If you have a personal family member in your side of the family, his side or her side, that is having issues, and you know by sharing that with your husband or your wife, it's going to cause them to resent your parents, resent your family. Right. It's really nothing to do with them. There's a fight between your two brothers or your two sisters or your sister-in-laws. Again, that's nothing to do with your marriage. That you may not necessarily have to share because, again, you don't want to create a feeling of resentment. Because we don't realize how certain issues get resolved, but the bad negative thoughts that we put about those people in our spouse's minds, those things stay for a very long right. time. If your mother called you and said, I don't like your husband, why didn't he stand up for me when I walked into your house or whatever, I'm just giving mm. a silly example. Right. And then you decide to share that and say, my mother said you should have respected her more. Again, you're going to cause your husband or your wife to feel a certain way about his mother-in-law or father-in-law and say, excuse me, I didn't even pay attention to that. Right. So those things I feel like for, for purposes of unity and Peace. a good marriage, um, yeah. you shouldn't overshare. But again, I know your therapy world is different, Avi, and um, this is why, yes, boundaries are very, very important, but I don't want people to really think boundaries mean that we can hide and lie about where we are we went to we went out with our friends and our husband calls us and says where are you and we say oh we're at work right now and thinking well i have to have a you know privacy it doesn't have to know everything i don't think that's a safe marriage mm -hmm. if you feel the need to hide where you are if you feel the need that you like can't that. tell your husband where you are because he's going to get upset at you so you're going to lie your way out of it this is a cause of problems because eventually if by accident it slips out or he comes to your work because he decides to surprise you and pick you up today and guess what you're not there anything is possible right. you will set yourself up to problems so we have to be very very careful yes oversharing we don't need to tell everything to our spouse but we have to create a, a relationship where we feel comfortable enough to share even those things that may hurt them right. and then talk about it right. and say why does it hurt you Maybe we can talk about why I did that, even though you were hurt. And that's how you build each other. That's how you form love. 
That's how you form that bond of understanding Beautiful. and talking about it. So exactly what you said, you know, using your judgment. So we, we can't we can discuss all situations, right? You have to use your judgment in any situation that you're placed. If you know that something is going to irritate your spouse and there's nothing good going to come out of it, then then don't do it. But if something like your said, first of all, obviously, wherever you are, if a spouse asks you, you know, where are you? Um, that's that that's important, you know, just to be able to be comfortable enough to say the truth, you know, not lie. And if you are and if you feel like you need to lie, where is that really coming from? You, it's always very important that's to true. find to find the, the, the root of the problem, right. you know. But what I will say is sometimes you know, when let's talk about the government, right? When policies are created, why does a policy get created? Because there's a problem, right? So where does the line start? It could be, let's, I'll give you a situation. Let's say a couple got married. The husband calls the wife and says, where are you? She says, oh, I just went to the store and, and I had to get myself a shirt, right? I'm giving you a typical example. And he's, again, you're going to the store, you're buying money, you're buying something again, again, you're spending money. You know, we don't have enough money for rent. You're taking them, you, you know, you're not being smart. You're not being wise. And he goes on and on and on and on. It happens once. It happens twice. It happens uh, uh, twice. It happens three times. At that point, she understands that. Oh, every time I tell him that I'm spending money, he always yells at me. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to lie. This is exactly how kids begin to develop lying as well. Whenever they feel like they said the truth the first time and they got in trouble for it and it wasn't explained to them properly, they feel like, huh, let me let me start to create, let me formulate a lie and let, let's see what happens. And when they get away with that, it gets stronger and stronger and stronger. So when your spouse actually tells you the truth, even though you want to react a certain way, stop, think, breathe for a second and pause. discuss it. Pause. Exactly. You don't have to necessarily discuss it at that moment, at the heat of the moment. Talk about it. Um, if you remember watching our live last week, we spoke about having date night and talking about some of your concerns. So talk about it on date night and say, this is what I noticed this week. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Right. And somebody actually wrote in the comments, take why uh, Milana, this is, this is a shout out to you. You said why should be out of your vocabulary, right? right? Oh, so when you that. say when you also, when you say the word why, it could sound a little bit accusatory. So so just to say, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Can gives them an opportunity to open up and share. It doesn't sound like you're judging them, right? Sometimes you know people wonder why are therapists so great at doing what they do. It's because they're empathizing. They're meeting the person where they're at and they're not judging them they're just really trying to understand their behavior why did you do what you did right tell me more about that you can you do know? that even with like a pedophile you can feel that empathy so that's that's a very good question you're asking you know esther's asking can you do that with a pedophile you know pedophilia is a serious what is a matter pedophile? a pedophile is somebody who touches uh, younger children inappropriately sexually yeah. right How do you so emphasize with them? so this is that's that's a really serious question and unfortunately this is out there and it's hard it's very hard because what they're doing is a hundred percent inappropriate right but even a person like that a person who is a pedophile they have a story also again i am not condoning their behavior one bit it's inappropriate it's it should not happen Thanks. and it's it, it's it's completely completely crossing all boundaries and I'm not okay with it whatsoever. However, they also have a story. They might have been sexually abused. They might have been hurt. They might have been through some type of trauma and this is why they're doing what they're doing, right? Think about it, you know, and they're trying to get help. And they're trying, they're there are many people who are trying to get help, but because this it, it turned into addiction that it's so strong that they can't even control themselves. So when they go to therapy and cry and bawl and say, I want to fix this issue, but I don't know what to do. The urge is so strong. You, you, you feel for them, even though what they're doing is completely inappropriate and they want wow. to stop. So before we go on to the next question, I'm going to bring up another topic right now because um, I think this is very, very important. Comparing marriages. Um, so Avi, the reason I brought this topic up is because you said something about the example that you use, like a typical example of somebody going out and shopping and yeah. spending a lot of money. And uh, I think a lot of it also has to do, again, I might be wrong. This is just my assumption of things. We make the mistake of comparing our marriages to other people's. For example, we compare our marriage to our friend's wife. His wife is earning a lot of money. Why is our wife sitting and she doesn't want to work? And it's not fair because it's so hard for me as a guy. And my friend must have it so much easier because his partner is actually helping him. He can come home and he can talk to her. I can never talk to my wife about anything. 
or comparing other people's husbands. He's always buying her gifts. He never forgets her birthdays. And my husband doesn't even remember when we got married. And I think that the uh, a very, very big, big, big problem of why marriages are not so successful, and we're going to make the statistics after this, we forgot to uh, mention the statistics, is because we start to get into the habit of focusing on everybody else's life around us as what's considered good and perfect and then coming back and saying why is my husband not doing that for me why is my wife not looking like his wife she takes care of herself she lost weight when she had 10 kids and my wife had a kid and she says she can't lose weight like what's going on here why is she not taking care of herself like his wife is taking care of herself so comparing your life with other people's comparing marriages is really a big no no what do you want to say about that esther it's not apples to apples i think um it's really hard not to compare uh because we grow up in the environment of comparison like who got the best grade on the test or how did everyone do how did i score in comparison to everybody i tell this to my children all the time don't check how good someone else has been how someone else did check how much better you're doing from yesterday so i think you should take that into your marriages and me included about you know it's not about how good they have it because it's really about your own story you're you no one's ever gonna love your book as much as you are you are the best character in your own story but if you're too busy reading other people's books you're never gonna have time to write your own and and appreciate whatever those challenges are part of you know what i mean um i i think there's a lot of stress related to comparison also because when you do do comparison it makes the spouse feel inferior it makes the spouse not want to engage it makes your spouse feel like hey why should i even try i'm never really recognized because i'm not good enough right. and and when that happens i want you and myself to remember why did i get married what was the like what was the spark about what was the the joy something i heard that was so powerful from a successful uh, like a person who's been married many years he said remember the good in your spouse so when you start whatever you focus on grows like if you're focused on the deficit in your partner there's just going to be more of that if you focus on the blessings in your partner even if there are more blessings outside of the house but that little bit he, he was kind to you he was a good parent he was a good parent with homework with your kid or or something build on that and there will be stepping stones on the way that you'll fall over which are really stumbling blocks but in the end you turn them again into stepping stones and you learn from them because that's just feedback you're just getting feedback beautiful before we read Very izzy's well comment and i think that's a perfect comment don't cheat avi i don't want you to read that oh one okay yet. okay i'm not looking um tell us what do you think about comparison in a marriage so i think it actually ties with both with what you both said um mind reading you know if there's something you like let's say right yeah, that you you'd, you'd like for your spouse to do I understand that, you know, it comes up in therapy, you know, why should I have to tell him to compliment me? I want him to do it naturally. It's not possible. We're not, you know, people are not mind readers. If there's something you like, teach them, let them know, tell them. You mm -hmm. tell them once, you tell them twice, and eventually they will learn. To, they, we, we um, spouses genuinely want to make each other happy. Nobody, nobody wakes up in the morning and say, today I want to be miserable, right? Generally, people don't do that, right? right? So if there's something you would like from your spouse, tell them, tell them once, tell them twice. Even if they leave the towel on the bed multiple times or the socks on the floor or, you know, you want your wife to, 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 to wear a certain type of outfit, let them know. Tell them this is what makes me... But in a uh, sweet way. In a sweet way, right, 100%. And do be it. okay. Right. Be okay with them saying, I would rather not. Like sometimes... There you go. Like, People don't want to say because they don't want to hear no. Okay. But like, I hear that. That's already a good remember, like, he might not agree with They, they don't want to set themselves that, up for failure. Yeah, but don't let that ruin the, the But also, just because they say no most of the time doesn't mean you have to stop asking. They might surprise you. So, again, if you in do it, exactly what you said, that's the key. Do it in a sweet way. It's interesting. I don't know how true this is, but you ladies will say, if you want something, they say, if you want something, if you want to get something from the guy, feed his stomach first, right? So, if that works for him, 
Great, get him, you know, make him a nice meal and, and then ask him what you want him to do. You know, you know your own. Um, I think it's important to approach him when, when it's a, like that feeling that, yeah, definitely. You know, so or if you know your wife likes beautiful flowers, so then get her beautiful flowers. Again, we're not talking about, you know, every time you want something, you have to bribe each other with, with some massive <laughs> gift. Here's a nice. <laughs> you know, exactly. I want but dress. again, it's all about it's all about compassion, showing compassion and kindness to each other. And don't forget that, you know, oh, you owe me. We're actually, you know, one of the questions, can we go to the next Not one? Not yet. Oh, Izzy. okay. Love this comment, actually, because I think uh, we have something to say about this. It's all about, it's a lot of it has to do with social media. Everything seems to be too perfect on Facebook, which leads to comparison. That is so absolutely true. Because even before we went on this live, okay, if only you saw the behind the scenes that oh, took place. The work. It was before hilarious. Before we got glammed it up, was, yeah. came here, hooked up our backdrop over here. I hope Can you I get like a it. Like for this? Avi this picked was that out for us. Idea. Okay, um, it's not Esther's beautiful wall. We actually put a backdrop. Actually, she has there. really beautiful she walls, does. but. Um, yeah. And the conversation that happened, what the prayer that we had to say before we make we we came on here, the same thing is with life. You see a snapshot of a picture of a guy, a husband, a wife, you know, loving each happy, other and they're so yeah. happy and they're kissing each other and he's giving her this right. gift. Right. And then the and second the caption is so before and after, you don't understand what's going on, what that atmosphere was like, because mm. that snapshot that you see of a perfect marriage, of a perfect vacation, of a perfect gift is not always what it appears to be. Some people, and this is again my opinion, portray a life on social media that they wish they had. Right. It's not the life they actually have. Right. It's the life they want to portray that they have. So they're busy capturing all these beautiful moments to make everyone around them think that they're so perfectly married. But if you actually go and see what their life looks like at home, it's completely the opposite of what's being portrayed on social media. I heard, I heard a, a very interesting quote. You ready for this? Everyone has a chapter they don't read out loud, right? Everyone has something that they're holding on near and dear to their heart that they don't necessarily want to share. But also to, to transition this into dating, you know, sometimes they say, you know, I, yeah, we went out on the first date and he was such a gentleman or she was so sweet and, and, and kind, right? Um, yeah, but they're just acting, right? They're great actors on the first date or second date. First of all, it's not necessarily acting. It's their put, them putting their best foot forward. If you don't have a certain skill, like for example, if a person is, is genuinely a stingy person, it's very hard to keep up that act for a long time. It eventually will come out somehow, right? These type of red flags will come out. So if they're out there on the first date and you know sometimes when they get married, they say, you never acted like this on the date, right? This is the best version of themselves. It doesn't mean that they're necessarily lying or they're they're creating a this fake facade of who they are. But if this is how they can act well and nice and, and, and romantic on a date, they can also act this way in life. But this is a skill that they have to to master. It's something that they have to do every single day to try to better themselves every day. Marriage, like you said, there's no marriage that's perfect. It takes a lot of work. We have time for one more question. Let's yeah. shuffle it up. Let's one see. last question. All right, here, well. here we go. Shuffle, and if, shuffle, and shuffle. If anybody wants to give a comment, do it because this is no, going to be our last question. Oh, you're going to pick okay. one. Okay. Oh, these are, can I cheat and just look at this? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> so you're going to pick it out, okay? Okay, here we go. That's fine. Uh, do you think marriage should be a 50-50 partnership? Explain. First of all, what do you guys think? Do you think marriage is 50-50? Who gives more? Who gives less, maybe? What do you guys think? Is marriage 50-50? I'm curious what people will say because uh, I've actually asked this question before. And I have... Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I read it in this book called The, um, the Compound Effect. Mm -hmm. He was talking about this. Uh, the speaker, this person, the author in the book, is sharing his story of how he was in the audience and the speaker was saying... It is marriage 50-50? Uh, does one person give 100%? Uh, how does that work? And everybody was saying it's 50-50. Of course it's 50-50. And the, the speaker said, no. It's 100% and zero. You're 100%. Your partner is zero. That means that you take personal extreme ownership for your part in the relationship. Not like to say we're counting points. Like today I have to feed the kids tomorrow. You should do the dishes because I do most of the work in the house. It's like taking um, really just 
personal responsibility not to tell the other partner you should do this you should do that but again like what can you offer right. in the relationship not to say that i don't also i think i think in a true marriage there it gets kind of gray but this is definitely an aspiration you have it your turn avi go ahead with this no one. no no you have it it's all you i think marriage is i don't want to put a number to it you can say marriage is a hundred percent here and a hundred percent here I think marriage is giving it all you have to give. Some people are better at certain things than other people right. are. For example, you may be the most helpful spouse. If I call you and say, hey, I'm stuck, I'm 50 miles away, can you come and pick me up? And he'll drop everything and he'll come and pick you up. And other people have a very hard time with that particular trait. But when you ask them to cook you the most delicious meal when you're sick, that's their 100%. So giving your 100-100 for everybody is different. My 100% in this marriage is what I can offer you. Accept it for what it is. Don't be, I can't be like you want me to be all the time. You may be the best person in getting up and helping me pick up the heavy shopping because it came to your mind. Maybe it didn't come to help my mind. I did not help you on purpose. It's just not something that came to mind when I saw it. So you have to understand my 100% may not be your 100%. Your 100% is not my 100%. When two people are living together and they understand that their spouse has a weakness in something and that weakness is okay, that to me makes a perfect marriage. Accepting your partner for his flaws, not only for his great qualities. Go ahead. Wow. Wow. That is, I mean, yeah, both of you guys, to follow that is extremely, uh, extremely difficult. But what I will say is, um, to quote both of you, yes, give it all you got, but don't forget about yourself also, because you are very important in the relationship. Sometimes in a relationship, we give 110%, we throw ourselves in the relationship and because, you know, like, for example, a mom, she's there fully for her kids and for her husband and her and the spouse is fully there, you know, is trying to support the family, getting the mortgage, being at work. Right. And they forget about themselves and, and self-care. Self-care is also very, important. very important in order for you to, to be there for your children and for your spouse. You first have to take care of yourself when you get on an airplane and they, you know, they say when, when right, the oxygen right, comes right. out, what do you have to do first? Nice. You first put it on yourself. In order for you to be able to help someone next to you, whether your spouse or your child, you have to be mentally and physically okay yourself. So yes, marriage, you have to work at it. You have to try so hard to give it the best you can. But also, don't forget to take care of yourself. You can't pour from an empty cup. You can't pour from an empty cup, exactly. You have to invest in yourself. Invest so guys, Avi, we're gonna end off yeah, by reading the so statistic. Much. What oh, is okay. the statistic? The of, statistics. I mean, it's, I believe it's it's fifty. It's fifty one. Based on our research, what we did, um, it is fifty one percent. More more percentage is of divorce. And interestingly, Michael Barokhov said, when people date, they do not work on fifty fifty. But he also said. No, marriage is not 50-50. Uh, the divorce is 50-50. So it's interesting. I, I like to hear that. You know, that's, that's very interesting. It's very you know? sad that divorce is 50-50. Yeah. Yeah. And even some people say divorce is 51%. Yeah. Marriage is 49%. Yeah. I hope our show here today will help you, that are, all the people that are struggling. There Remember, just like when you're going to college and you have your end point and you know there's struggle and there are hard tests and there's failures and there's not sleepless nights but you stick through it because you have a goal and that goal is to finish your degree and and show yourself that you can do it same too with marriage marriage is having a goal you have to have a goal to build up to it there's no such a thing of getting married and having a perfect life i actually always tell people who just get married first year of your marriage for anybody who just got married can be the hardest year of your life it sounds weird you love each other you fell in love there's no kids around so you have so much time for each other so how could that be the hardest year it's going to be one of the hardest years of your marital it can, it life it can be the hardest she's going she's predicting <laughs> she's like, because you're you're all new at this 
things that you didn't notice before about him, all of a sudden you're realizing how he puts his toothbrush, how he throws the socks, the way he eats. Mm -hmm. is not always the way he ate on your date. Right. But that's your own Some building of the block. In the day is gone. So right. stay through, stay strong, and remember also, it gets all, better. All the questions that we got, don't think about the word divorce and don't ever bring it into your marriage. Um, okay. Uh, Last week, we, we got a lot of uh, comments back and private messages. Guys, we're here for you. If you have any questions, if you have anything that you'd like us to bring up or discuss uh, on live, please feel free. Once again, thank you so much, Esther, for hosting your house. You. Uh, and, and the host over here, Mrs. Yechava, for creating this incredible group. Thank you, uh, thank you so much, everybody who joined us tonight. If I wouldn't have both of them that actually agreed to be on our show, this show would not be possible. So I appreciate Avi. Avi is yeah. very, very busy. He comes here it's after his pleasure. sessions. He comes pleasure. here from his full-time job. Esther's pleasure. busy mother of five. She, you know, before we came in here, she was putting her kids to bed and trying to make sure we have a peaceful environment. Yeah. So I really applaud both of and you. And everyone knows you have it. The, you know, power, powerhouse PA and the mother and a wife and an incredible <laughs> entrepreneur. Yes. Yeah, so, so everybody, guys, thank you so much, much for tuning in. Have a good night, everyone. All Bye -bye. right.